So today we'll continue with our uh, lectures on machine learning. Um, and uh, just to remind you what we did last time, uh, we solved two of these classification problems based on the classification of iris flowers. Um, and we used two techniques for that, k-nearest neighbors and decision trees. Um, what we'll do today is um, transition from our linear and logistic regression, which are the, the regression and classification problems, um, to an, a, a general approach that can solve both of those problems and that uses neural networks. So we'll start by uh, just loading our usual um, preamble with scikit-learn. Um, and so what we're going to be doing now is uh, look at the similarities between the linear regression and the log logistic regression. And then we'll um, draw some conclusions from those similarities and generalize them and then expand on what we've learned. So in both cases, we used input features x sub i to predict an output target y, right? Um, in the case of linear regression, the output target was a continuous variable. In the case of logistic regression, the output target was actually um, a probability. So um, in, in order to be able to treat our classification um, as a problem that is similar to regression, we use the probability um, for all of the different output classes. And in determining how to connect our input features to our output target, um, we use these weights W sub i and a bias. Um, in the case of linear regression, we determine those weights and bias um, by doing a, a best linear fit to our training data. Um, so our training data x sub i um, with associated values of y, um, or x, x sub i for each measurement has one um, output target y. And so for each of those measurements, we did a best fit for all of our predicted values y n and our um, actual values y sub n and uh, we use this quadratic loss function, the least square fit essentially to our data. So nothing new there. Um, we, we've been able to, uh, to do this since, uh, I guess, the third week of classes or so. Um, but now uh, we've been able to do that in a way that uh, takes advantage of some of those scikit-learn techniques. And so as you can see, what we get here is the sum of our Ws and our Xs plus our Bs, so our sum of our weights with uh, input features and the bias. In the case of logistic regression, we used the same weights and biases, but now we determined probabilities Q, um, which were given then as our, our output target Y hat. Um, and now that was given by our um, one over one plus E to the power minus the sum of the weights times our input um, features plus the bias. So the, the part that appears here in our exponential is of course exactly the same as what we get in linear regression. Um, here we minimized the cross entropy loss function, so or minus the sum over the uh, um, uh, probabilities in our, our training set, um, log the probabilities that we um, predicted. So the only difference really between this first expression for linear regression and the second expression, expression for logistic regression um, is this, this nonlinear function, this logistic or also called sigmoid um, activation function. So that turns or z, which is our sum over w x plus b, um, into 1 over 1 plus e to the minus c. Uh, and, and that's the only difference. Um, you could even think of this y as also being f of z, where f of z is just equal to z. Um, so y will just be equal to the sum over w and x um, plus the, the um, bias. So that expression really, the sum over the weights multiplied with the input features plus the bias with an activation function f of z, um, that's the core unit of neural networks. This is so-called the, the single layer, single layer um, perceptron or just a perceptron or a neuron. Um, and it's similar to uh, how neurons work in uh, biology. So they have um, lots of inputs that come in through the synapses. Um, and then there's an activation function that is actually a very similar looking um, step type function that is continuous, like the sigmoid function, um, and that produces output um, in the cell body. So that's the core of what we'll be using. And so we've already seen two of those activation functions, the linear or identity activation function is what we used in um, linear regression. That's of course why it's a linear activation function. So f of z is just equal to z, 
Um, and you might wonder why don't we have f um, of z equal to 2z or 5z or 10z? Well, any rescaling in that z would be equivalent to changing our weights and our biases. So if we just pick f of z equal to um, 1 times z, that's general enough. Another activation function is just a regular step function. So if z is negative, the function is 1. Uh, if z is positive, the function is 1. If z is negative, the function is 0. Um, we have a logistic function here, 1 over 1 plus um, e to the minus z. Um, we have what we call a rectified linear unit, or ReLU, um, that's uh, equal to the identity, or the linear function for positive z, and it's 0 for negative z. Then we can use hyperbolic tangent, inverse tangent. Um, all of those functions have their advantages and disadvantages, and we can look at uh, um, the uh, expressions in um, the activation function page on Wikipedia. You can see here is our identity. We have a regular step or logistic function, hyperbolic tangent, arc tangent, and a bunch of others, and ReLU is probably here. Yep. Um, so all of these have their disadvantages and advantages. Um, in particular, um, there's, a, there's a reason why one might want a value that is bounded between 0 and 1 for probabilities or bounded between other values for, for uh, practical reasons, minus 1 and plus 1, for example. Um, but of course, if it's bounded, it means it won't have a monotonically increasing derivative. Um, and that aids in uh, divergence, uh, in convergence of our, our fitting. Um, of those uh, weights and biases to the data. Um, and it's also not equal to one for our z is equal to zero. So typically when we start off our algorithm, all of our activation, all of our weights and all our biases are zero. So what we get um, in, uh, in our outputs uh, will be given by those zeros that go into the activation function. And if that um, input is not approximately equal to one, um, then we might need to pay more attention to initializing our weights um, before we start fitting. Okay, so this is the basic unit, the single layer per perceptron or this, this neuron. Um, and so, of course, what we're going to do is now put um, a bunch of those together. So um, we'll, con um, we'll construct layers. So we have our inputs here. So let's say we have three inputs previously. We had only connections from this input through weights indicated by the arrows here directly to the output, which applied the activation function to it. So what we're doing now is adding an internal hidden layer. So now it becomes a multi-layer perceptron or simply an artificial neural network. So by having this hidden layer, each with one of those nonlinear, potentially nonlinear functions, and with weights on all of the arrows that are connected to the inputs. So this is a fully connected hidden layer because it's connected to all of the inputs. And in the output, it's connected to all of the previous um, outputs from the hidden layer. So in this case, this would be a, a, a multi-layer perceptron or artificial neural network with one um, hidden layer. And of course, we'd have uh, three times four different weights in this initial um, layer, going from layer zero to layer one. Um, and for each of the, the hidden layer perceptrons, hidden layer neurons, we would get one bias. And then going from the hidden layer to the output layer, we'd have two times, or four times two, so eight different weights and two different biases. So of course, this increases the number of, um, of, of weights and of biases that we have to determine. And that, of course, will require that we have more training data um, to work with so that we can actually um, determine the weights of all of those nodes appropriately, of the weight of the connection between the nodes. So of course, if we do this with just a linear um, activation function, then essentially this is a matrix multiplication going from input to hidden. And then from hidden to output is another matrix multiplication. Um, so essentially, if we combine these matrix multiplications in one operation, that becomes a single matrix up, up multiplication to get from the input to the output. So we've not necessarily gained anything. Um, that's why the linear problems are, are in some sense nothing new. We've already done that. Um, but what changes is now if we go to these nonlinear activation functions in this hidden layer in particular, now we can't just simply um, do the matrix multiplications of the, the input to hidden layer and the hidden to output layer. Um, there's a, a much more complicated connection there that is given by that nonlinear 
uh, activation function in the hidden layer. So um, with those nonlinear activation functions, we can still think, think in terms of matrices of the weights, um, but we can just propagate everything, everything through. Um, we have to keep in mind that there's this nonlinear activation function. Um, it does, however, allow to have a much richer set of connections between the input and the output because you're not just restricted to linear functions um, or linear dependencies of the output layers or the output targets variables on the input feature variables. So what we'll do next is we'll apply this to our linear regression problem in the, the diabetes um, data set and then we'll move on to um, handwriting recognition with artificial neural networks just based on essentially pixels um, in, the, in the input image. Um, and you'll see that um, this is in particular where these uh, neural networks can, uh, um, can have great, um, uh, great applications.